Uh, so this is a story about my best friend, uh, my best friend named Lance. In March of 2008, I received a phone call from him, and we had not spoken in a while. And I was living in Ann Arbor, Michigan, he was living out here. Uh, and he called me to say that in four months, he was going to be a father. And that he and his longtime girlfriend were going to get married that weekend at the Drake Hotel in Chicago. And the kicker on top of that was, no one was going to be invited that was not immediate family, including myself. I was hurt, stunned, and very, very disappointed. To which I responded, because I lived four hours away in Ann Arbor, I said, well, well, what makes you think I wasn't going to be at the Drake Hotel this weekend anyway? <laughs> and he laughed and said, I need you to abide by this, because what it, what it was, is it was essentially a shotgun wedding. It was a ceremonial appeasement to some very, very conservative grandparents. And because they couldn't invite everyone, they made the decision they're not going to invite anyone. So I just said, fine. I will not come to your wedding. And he said, thank you very much, my friend, for not coming to my wedding. Now, Lance and I met in 1995. We both started working at a restaurant in Chicago called The Onus. We met. We thought the other was awesome very quickly. We found each other funny. We were both products of a single mother, which is something that touches both of our hearts. And we became best friends very, very quickly. And Lance, to me, is the coolest guy in the room. He's one of those guys, the ones that people gravitate towards, that when he speaks, people are mesmerized, and to know him is to be enamored by him. He is Fonzie, and I, subsequently, am Richie. <laughs> so, uh, two of my favorite memories of Lance. One was, I was on the red line in Chicago, and it was a Saturday morning, I was going to a restaurant job, and I did not want to go to this restaurant at all. I was just, ugh. It was one of those mornings, and I'm sitting by the window on the train, and as we get off at the Chicago stop, uh, I'm still sitting there looking out the window, and as the big crowd of people is walking down, I see Lance amongst these people, and then something makes him turn, and he sees me, and just so very cool, he hits eye contact with me, walks over to the window, and just puts his hand on it. <laughs> Turn it in kind, I put my hand on it as well, and we're just two grown men holding it there like, like Kirk and Spock at the end of Rat of the Con. We're just holding it there. And, um, when the train starts to pull off, pull away, and he kind of walks with it. <laughs> so that's one of them. That's uh, one that uh, was one of my favorites, and we referenced that for many, many years. It was always one of those little moves that we would make to each other. The other one is this, and this moment epitomizes Lance to me. So a bunch of us went and did a show in Peoria, Illinois, that was at this restaurant where we did improv while people ate. <laughs> and it went mediocre. <laughs> so uh, the owner of the restaurant was so half-acidly thrilled with us that he said, I own the strip club next door. If you wanna if you wanna go hang out at the strip club next door, it's on me. <laughs> So three of us take him up on his offer, we walk into this strip club, which was a very, very loose term, and we walk in, and it is very sad, very <laughs> quick. Uh, and this is the scene, there are two stages, there's one here, and one here. On this stage back here, there is a big, buxom, vivacious woman just dancing around, the music is huge, and guys are just hooting and hollering, and just throwing dollar bills at her. On this stage is a much flatter gal who doesn't have the same attention and she's basically just nakedly moving the music. <laughs> and no one is in front of her and look, she's very sad. And uh, the three of us, uh, two of us want to just leave. Lance says, uh, hold on a second. So he goes over and he stands in front of this woman and he is very attentive and he has a nice smile on his face. And she starts to dance for him, and the song is almost over, and then when it ends, he gives her a little bit of money, and then as she leans down to take it, he whispers something in her ear, at which point she smiles, looks at him, and then gives him a kiss on the cheek. And then he smiles at her, and he walks back over to us. Me and the other guy are in awe. <laughs> <laughs> and say, oh my God, what did you just say to her? 
Lance looks at us with that unbelievably cool way, and he just says, Sorry, fellas, that's between me and the lady. <laughs> so now, uh, we cut ahead about a decade into his and my friendship, and in 2006, I'll make this, uh, this part pretty concise, but in 2006, some pretty heavy things happened to me, and, um, yes, I'm going to turn it this way. <laughs> My mother had five months to live and asked me to come home and help her. And it was a, one of those times, it was a very nice time period. But one of the things that we did, because we knew that it was a finite period, is that we decided we were going to make the best out of it. We were going to be optimistic, and we threw this big end-of-her-life party. It was just this huge lifetime movie moment decision that we made. And when it got closer to it, I called Lance, and I said... I'm really scared. I don't know what we're about to do. I need your help. And without hesitation, he said, yes, I'll come down and help you. So he flew uh, from Los Angeles out to Florida, where I was living with my mother, and he helped us through this pretty difficult thing, and he was there for support, and he did it just this magnanimous gesture that was completely selfless, and it was one of those touching things, and right before my mother died, he wrote her this letter that was so very sweet, saying that, not to worry, he would make sure that he looked after me and that I was part of his family and I would always be welcome in that. And it was a very lovely letter that I still have to this day. And I appreciated all the things that he did for me in that time period. It was really just, it earned my loyalty forever. Now we cut ahead two years where I'm sitting in my car, stunned, hurt, and disappointed because I'm told I can't go to his wedding. <laughs> And I'm just so upset. I'm sitting there thinking about me and my feelings about his wedding. And then I had this epiphany, this moment of clarity where I realized, for the thematic element of the story, it was time to grow up and to think about somebody else just besides me. When I faced a death, he did not question anything that I did, any decision I made. He only helped. So now as he faced a birth, the only thing I could do was to extend him the exact same courtesy and do whatever I could and just help. So I called him the next day and I said, here's the deal. I will not come to your wedding as you asked me. But, and this is non-negotiable, I am going to come down to Chicago the day before, and I'm going to help you with everything that you need. All the last minute planning stuff, I'm going to be there, I'll be at your beck and call. We will do whatever you need, I will just help you in whatever way I can. And he said, thank you, and I came down there, and we spent the afternoon at DSW buying dress shoes, <laughs> and we had a very lovely afternoon, and we reminisced, and we laughed, and he did a funny thing, because he's got one of those real big heads, that he took those little stockings that they supply at those big warehouse shoes, and he put it on his head, and walked around the store for me as I took pictures, and we just laughed. <laughs> uh, and then that afternoon, I dropped him off at his future in-law's house, and they were going, and... We were about to part ways as he was about to go embark on this wedding at the Drake Hotel and I was going to go stay with a friend of ours. And as we stood outside, uh, right as I was about to leave, because we had referenced it for years and he knew exactly what I was doing, I put my hand up <laughs> like this and he sauntered up to me and he put his hand up to mine. And we said some very nice things to each other and some things that really solidified the fact that we were not just friends, we were family and that we would always be there for each other. And if you are in any way curious as to what Lance and I said to each other that day, well, sorry, fellas. <laughs> That's between me and the lady. <laughs>